Sabbath. I hope you're not feeling the way the weather is outside. But I know when it's raining, you naturally you feel a little bit sad and annoyed. at like, suit getting wet, you know. But I hope inside we're happy to be in God's house. Because many of our brethren around the world don't have this privilege. I don't know if you follow the news and they don't detail it as much as they should, but Christian persecution is going on. Places like Pakistan, in predominantly Muslim countries, whether you're Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian Church, even if you carry the name of Christ, your church is getting burnt down. You're getting beaten up with sticks, even hanged and killed just for gathering to worship Christ. And that's a real, real reality. It's not as documented as it should be. I get a magazine, I believe, once a month called Release, it documents the systematic persecution and murder of Christians. Um, I'm sure you he heard about the, is the ISIS situation, right? And who were, who were those that were forced to flee? Christians. And now we're facing a, a genocide of, of people, tens of thousands of people in the mountains who have food and water, and most of them are Orthodox Christians. I don't know if you knew that. And is our government doing anything for them? No. So while we have this proof that we have here in this country, Let's not take it for granted that we have food, shelter, clothes, we can come and worship, and no one's knocking on our door telling us, choose Jesus or death. So with that being said, um, I've been introduced. My name is Michael, Michael Danzi. I just live down the road, um, originally from London. I'm a member of Wolverhampton Central, and nothing more really to say, really. I love God, and I just love just sharing his word, and that's it. That's my passion. We're just gonna, I'm just going to start with a brief word of prayer, um, and you just bow your heads with me. I'm going to choose to now. Father in heaven, my words have absolutely no power. So I'm asking according to your promise, because you don't lie, that if I ask for the Holy Spirit, you give him unto me, so that hearts will understand because when we understand your word, then we know you exist. Because only you can speak to our hearts and speak about those things that we're thinking about. Speak about those problems and those trials that are burdening our hearts. And I pray, Father, that you will speak to us today. Make it clear who you are, your character of love, of mercy. So that when we leave this place, we will see our need for you in a different way, in a deeper way. And not only that, to leave with an assurance, an assurance of our salvation. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. chosen to title the presentation today. Can everyone see that on the screen all right? Ah, you lot don't know me, you know, I'm going to wait for responses. <laughs> Can everyone see that on the screen? Yeah. Okay. All right, you may not be used to getting feedback, but, you know, you're gonna, with me, I like some, some feedback. Um, is Jesus better than reality? Is Jesus better than reality. I want to start with this statement. What is reality? What would you say reality is? Shout out some words, some phrases. What is reality? <coughs> Give me some thoughts, some ideas. What comes to your mind when I say, what is reality? What would you say? Come on, what would you say? What's reality? Now. now. What else? Truth. Truth. All right. Think more, don't think Christian, just think reality. What's reality? Evidence. Evidence, physical things, right? What else? We associate reality with things that are real, right? <laughs> Fact, truth, things you can see, you can hear, things you can establish, correct? Reality doesn't, has nothing to do with deception, fraud. Reality is based on truth, facts, things that's actually going on. Something that is real, correct? If the, the Bible makes a claim 
The Bible makes a claim. What is that claim? Go with me to John 17, 17. The Bible makes a claim. What is reality? Reality is those things that are real. Facts now bears witness of truth. Reality. John 17, 17, the Bible makes a claim. John 17, 17. Are we there, church? Visiting friends? John 17, 17. The Bible makes a claim. What is that claim that it makes? John 17, 17. Jesus is praying in this context. Jesus, these are the words of Christ. Notice what he says. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is what? Truth. truth. If the Bible then is truth, if the Bible is truth, that means it must speak about reality. It must speak about your and my experience. Does that make sense? Is that a simple premise? The Bible must speak about the world's reality. Does that make sense? If the Bible is true, but it had nothing to say about what's going on, wouldn't you question it as being the truth? Wouldn't you? Right? If it had nothing to say about your reality and my reality, wouldn't you question it as whether it's the truth? This is why young people question the Bible as being true. Because they don't hear from the pulpit, from the home, from the Sabbath school, things that are to do with reality. They don't see the relevance. We don't explain it in a way that they can see that the Bible is very real because it's speaking about things that are going on right now. And I'm going to touch on something that the Bible has that speaks of reality. And that thing is called prophecy. Prophecy speaks about history in advance. Events that's taken place so one can see with their beady eyes what has taken place in correspondence with the word of God to see, hey, the word of God said this prior and I can see it took place. That's reality. That's reality. Go with me to Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. What is the purpose of prophecy? Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. What is the purpose of prophecy? Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Because biblical prophecy speaks about reality. Things that have gone on and things that are going to take place. But what is the purpose of Bible prophecy? Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. The Bible says this. Are we there? It says, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is what? None else. Pause it for a moment. Isn't that a bold claim? That is not politically correct today in our society. You go around saying that God is the only God, and you must worship him. He's the only way. You see how quick you're going to be persecuted by your friends and your family. Let me illustrate. If you were to say today that I believe in one man, one woman is the true definition of marriage, you see how quick you're going to get laughed at at school. For those of you that have jobs, if you used to say in your workplace today, I believe that the lifestyle of homosexuality is wrong, you would be fired or you'd be sent to training. Amen? Amen. I'm not talking food for am I? That's fact, right? That's reality, right? That's the present reality you live in, that you are not free to speak your belief without persecution. Is that reality? But then the Bible tells us that that state of things that's going on in the workplace will happen. Did that exist 50 years ago in our country? It was illegal to be an open practicing homosexual. Illegal. 99% of the whole entire nation of England frowned upon it. You had to do it in secret. You couldn't be an open, as they say, he's come out of the closet. Are the turn that's game. You couldn't be an open practicing homosexual because the thinking, the mindset of people was still in harmony in this area with the word of God. So today, not literally saying, oh God is the only way, that's not going to rile up people. But speaking his principles will rile up people. 
Say, no, 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 the Bible says this and that's the only way to live. Live an opposite way and there's consequences. What are you talking about? I'm saying getting married with a man and a woman is what the Bible condones. You see how quick persecution is going to come against you. So when the Bible says there is none else, I am God, there's none like me. Why is God so bold in this area to declare that there's none like him? Verse 10 gives us the answer. Declaring the what? Declaring the what? The end from when? The beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Past tense or future tense? Future tense. Declaring the end from when? The beginning. Prophecy. God says in this area, there's none like me because only I have the power to prophesy and delineate events perfectly before they even take place. Study the Quran, absolutely not one prophecy. Study the Hindu scriptures, no prophecies. Study the Buddhist scriptures, no prophecy. And every other religious book in the world that claims to be inspired by some deity has no prophecies. Only the Bible. And yet we suddenly hear about the prophecies. When this church, if you didn't know, I'm going to tell you and go and do your research. This church was founded upon prophecy. It was Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 that showed them the nearness of Christ coming. That gave 20 year olds and 17 year olds and 19 year olds the conviction to preach. That gave James White the conviction not to do his degree as an English teacher. But at 21 years old he rode on a horseback with a chart of the 2300 days prophecy and baptized a thousand souls at the age of 21. Which 21 do you know who's allowed to baptize a thousand souls? Church, we're dead. Like wood that's been gnawed, eaten out by wormwood. We're dead. And I believe the reason why we're dead, the word of God doesn't have a central place in our lives. When Ezekiel saw the value of dry bones, just bones lying on the floor. He's like, what on earth is going to make dead bones live? God said, preach, prophesy. Then all of a sudden, as he spoke the word of God, those dry bones connected to each other. Flesh was put on those bones. And then he saw an army of the Lord. And he said, well, what has given these dry bones life? He preached the word of God. Because the word of God has life because it speaks about truth. It speaks about reality. And what is the reality of our sinful condition? What is the reality of this world? Let me read for you something that's going to really, really... I want, I want you to be agitated today. I want to agitate you to the core. Because we're so dead, it's nauseating. We're so dead, the Bible says, Jesus says, and you're going to look at me and say, Mike, what are you preaching, false doctrine? Jesus says, my church makes me sick. Do you want to read that? Do you want to read that? Go to Revelation chapter 3. These are not my words, church. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. Notice, I was reading this last week. The pastor was preaching, um, I believe, no, the pastor, the elder was preaching on Revelation 3. And as we're speaking about the church's true condition, it's Laodicean condition. We're not hot, we're not cold. These words came to my mind as he's read this text. We make God sick. Now listen to me, read this with me. Revelation 3, okay? Revelation 3, we're reading from verse um, 15. We're, re we're reading verse 15. Are we there, church, and visiting friends? Yeah. It says this, I know thy works, that thou art neither what? Cold nor hot. I would that thou wert what? Cold or hot. So then because thou art what? Lukewarm in the middle, and neither what? Cold nor hot. I will spew thee out of my what? Who is he speaking to? The world? The drug addicts, the adulterers and fornic, who's Jesus speaking to? His church. 
I will spew the out my mouth. When you take a glass of lukewarm water, what feeling do you get? Right. Jesus said, my church makes me sick. Young people want to play church but sing for God on Sabbath. You make me sick. You're a hypocrite. We make people promises, I'll give you Bible studies, but never turn up. People put down their names for baptism, we never follow up. You make me sick. But here's the hope with such a solemn and straight message to the church in the last days. Here's the hope. Because Jesus has to be that straight to wake us up. When the doctor knows you've got cancer, does he mince his words? Does he call in the clowns and the circus to play and make you feel nice? No, it's a solemn time. Because it's a terminal illness. It's a solemn time. You've got cancer, you've got diabetes, and it's gnawing, you've got gangrene at your foot. No jokey time now. The physician lowers his tone of voice. He said, do you have any, any family members that you want to call? And you're sitting there thinking, what was he talking about? And you kind of know where he's going. The situation demands a certain type of speech and talk. And when you look, look at yourself, look at the body of Christ, look at the world and ask yourself, do we need foolishness preaching? Do we need jumpy, jumpy up praise and worship? Or do we need to know how do I be saved? Because Jesus is coming soon. And won't be tired us. We had so many opportunities when he burst through that cloud. We're looking and running away like the Bible said for the mountains and the rocks to fall upon us. And then you're going to regret the many opportunities you had to repent. Would it be worth it then? Would that boy be worth it then? When the lion of the tribe of Judah not coming as a lowly lamb anymore, coming as a king of kings and lord of lords for his subjects, would that dance all be worth it now? Would it? Would that woman be worth it? Would that type of music be worth it? When he burst through those clouds, looking with fire in his eyes, coming as a judge, not as a saviour, because that time is up, will it be worth it? No, it will not. Solemn times. The elder talked about signs of Jesus coming. This elder talked about signs of Jesus coming. And I sat and I prayed this morning, Lord, what shall I preach? I had my manuscripts out. Lord, which one I was praying? Every time I go to speak, it is not a human thing. It is a God's divine appointment. So I don't come in with my own words. I don't come in depend upon myself. I need to know what do God's people need and only he knows that. So I put the manuscripts out. Lord, what shall I preach? What shall I say? I want people to know you. I want people to be saved. What am I going to say? He said prophecy. And when the elder talked about signs of Jesus coming, when this elder next to me, Horatio, talked about in his prayer, signs of Jesus coming, we can see the signs. I bow my eyes, I said, Pan, you're real. You answered my prayer. That's why I'm bold like this. You might be thinking, what's going on with this guy? Because I know God is real because he spoke to me on what you don't need today. Because he knows your heart. I don't know your heart. I don't know your trust. I don't know your pride. I don't want to know. I'm not the savior. I can't take it. I'm a human being. But God knows where you are at. And God knows where he can bring you. Amen. Amen. Now let's read Revelation 3. Because here's the hope. I said here's the hope. You can't hear things like that and be hopeful. You make me sick. If you don't, you know, I'm going to spew you out. No, 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 no. That's not the gospel. That's pointing out only the problems. The gospel, the word gospel means good news. Amen. So Michael, where's the good news then? Look at me in verse 19. Where's the good news? As many as I what? Hmm. <laughs> as many as I what? What does he do? I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. That's hope. That's why God doesn't mince his words with you because he loves you so much. That's why he's straight with you because he loves you so much. That's why he's going to point out how you really are because he 
loves you so much. We don't see, we are blind, leading the blind. We're going over a precipice and he needs to wake us up because he loves us with an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31 verse 3 says, With everlasting kindness have I drawn thee. Romans 2 verse 4 says, It is the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. And where is the biggest demonstration of God's love? Where is the clearest demonstration? Where is God at his best? Is it in creation? No, even though we praise him for that on the Sabbath. God, you have power to create. When you speak, it is done. When you say something, time doesn't wait. It is done like this. Yes, praise him for that. But where is God at his best? At the cross. Amen, someone said it. Where God is at his best, is where he's at his lowliest and it's at the cross. God is at his best when it seems like it is at his worst. At the cross. When Jesus Christ died for men's sins, that was God at his best. Think about this for a moment. Is God's mind infinite or finite? infinite now ask yourself the question if God's mind is infinite why was there not another way he could have used to show off his love why couldn't he just I don't know in his infinite possibilities of ways to try and convince us how much he loves why couldn't he think of something else is that a logical question in, you know in his box of tricks so to speak you know God is infinite he can do anything why couldn't he just you know Ah, oh, look, boom, do something, can you? and it will convince us he loves me. The only thing he could come up with, the only thing he could do, was send Jesus to die for men's sins. And the reason why there's only one way, the reason why is because the penalty is the wages of sin is death. So if that's the penalty, if that's the consequence, it's almost like, I put it in illustration, one has diabetes. And if diabetes can be cured, then that means because of the nature of the problem, then there can only be one solution. Does that make sense? All right? So, uh, you know, if anyone's had wood, um, what's those little creatures that more, um, eat wood? Wood, is it, no, they eat wood. Termites, all right? Termites are going through the house, yamming, yamming up, sorry for my slang. They're eating up the, the, the wood, right? They're eating up the wood, just yawning it. Oh, I'm going to say yamming up the wood. <laughs> now, 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 termites, if you've ever had termites, what if I take my aftershave and pss, 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 is that going to work? Oh, no. no. So the nature of the problem dictates the solution, right? So the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Are you telling me I don't deserve to have life? That means there's only one solution. One someone has to pay for my debt. And that person to pay for my debt must have what? Eternal life. You can't pay death with death. Does that make sense? Because you haven't paid it. Because you're dead. You haven't paid the debt, you're dead. If I pay for my debt, I'll be dead. I haven't paid for it. So what do you need? You need life. Now how did sin enter into this world? The Bible says it was through one man called Adam. And the Bible says what is sin? What is sin, church? The transgression of the law. Sin is not just this, just this thing. We think of sin as just you know, actions and just, just this thing. No, sin is the going against a standard. Our government has a standard, laws to govern and keep safe those who are obedient and to punish those who are transgressors. Every governor on the earth has laws to keep the well-being of society together. Well, what is God's jurisdiction? Is it only this earth or is it the entire universe? The entire universe. So God has a law for the well-being of the universe. But one chose to go against that standard. Who was that? Satan. 
But God couldn't destroy Satan immediately because none actually fully was aware to the true intents of his purpose. How do we know that? Isaiah 14 verse 12 and 13. Go with me there. How do we know that? Have you ever wondered why didn't God destroy Satan straight away? Have you ever wondered that? It's a very sincere question. I've wondered that. When I first came to Christ and started studying my Bible, that was one of the main questions. Why didn't you just destroy that wretch? Why you let him go on and then ask me to resist him? And then if I lose, I'm going to be lost. Like it's my fault. Now don't pretend like you ain't had that question. Don't pretend like you don't wonder that sometimes. Because the reality is God is okay up in heaven. Jesus is okay. He conquered him. But I'm not okay. I'm here in this sinful world being battered left, right and center. And sometimes I feel like I have no strength. And then God's going to judge me and say, sorry, you never made it. So we have to understand God's character. We have to understand. Because for us to follow him, we need to know if he's fair and just. Does that make sense? Look at Isaiah 14 very quickly, talking about the biography of Lucifer. Look what it says in verse 12. How art thou fallen from where? O heaven, O Lucifer. Talking about Satan himself. Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which did us weaken the nations? Verse 13, note it very carefully, concentrate with me now. Verse 13 is where we get the answer of why God didn't destroy him straight away. For thou has said in thy what? Hmm. Where is he saying these things? Where is he saying it? In his heart. Now let's look at what he said in his heart. I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my what? Pause it for a moment. My what? Now Bible students, we ain't got time to go through this. I hope you should know the answer. Did Satan have a throne? No. The only one who has a throne is a king. Now what position did Satan occupy before he was Satan, Lucifer? What position did Lucifer occupy when he was created? Someone said it, covering cherub. Covering cherub. Keep your fingers here, go with me to Psalm 99 verse 1. Keep your fingers here, we're going right back. We're coming right back. Psalm 99 verse 1 tells us what position that literally is, where that is in heaven. Psalm 99 verse 1. Psalm 99 verse 1. Psalm 99 verse 1. Are we there, church, and visiting friends? Covering cherub, correct? You can qualify that in Ezekiel 28, 12, 13, and 14, and 15. Covering cherub. Because of time, we're just going to go to where is that specifically in relation to his position in heaven? The Lord reigneth. Let the people tremble. He, talking about the Lord, sitteth between the what? Cherubims. Let the earth be moved. Cherub is one, cherubims is plural. The Bible says, who sits in between the cherubims? God himself. So Lucifer occupied the second, listen to me carefully, the second highest position in heaven. The second. So what would we now? This is why I love the Bible. We're investigating. I go back to Isaiah 14. Now let's read the words, I will exalt my throne. Isaiah 14. So he's right by the throne of God. God sitteth in between the cherubims. Literally like this. Picture it like this. God is here. These two elders are cherubims. Lucifer used to occupy one of these two positions. Right? So look to Isaiah 14. I, verse, verse 13, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my what? Throne above the what? Stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. If he's going to exalt his throne, does he have a literal throne? No. So what is his agenda? What is his ad intention? Right, to take over. But in his heart, the language is as if he already has one, isn't it? I will exalt my present tense. I will exalt my throne. You don't have a throne, brother. As young people used to say, well, I used to say, you don't have a throne, blood. Brad, do you not have no throne? What do you think this is? But that's what Satan is saying. I will exalt my, what? Throne. 
out is on my throne. So his agenda, now where is he saying this? In his heart. Now Revelation 12, quickly, stay with me now. Go ahead, go Revelation 12. We're covering the point. God couldn't destroy Satan straight away because the angels did not fully discern his true agenda. Revelation 12, is a, a Revelation 12. The Bible is clear on this point. Revelation 12. Notice this with me. Revelation 12, verse 7 to 9. We're reading the same similar scenes in Isaiah 14, but in different pictures now. But we're reading about the same scenes. Revelation 12, we're reading from verse 7. Are we there? And there was war where? Pause it for a moment. Have you ever imagined? Now, some of you have never been, some of you haven't grown up Christian. So this point should work. If you ever thought about heaven as a young child, some of you at one brought up Adventist, had no religious background. But if you did think about heaven, did you ever equate heaven a place of war? Ask any child on the street, no matter what their background is, you say heaven. If they have some kind of idea, they'll say, yeah, it's a good place, right? These words, there was war in where? Heaven. Mike and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Verse 8, hallelujah for verse 8. And prevailed not. not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Verse 9 is our key text. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called who? The devil, the devil and Satan, which, what's that next word? Deceiver. Deceive of how much? The whole world. Question. According to the Bible, he's a deceiver, correct? Yes. So when we go to Isaiah 14, now go back to Isaiah 14, we see this. Let's recap now. He occupied the second highest position in heaven because he was a cherub. And the cherubs are right by the throne of God. Psalm 99 verse 1. And Isaiah 14 says, how did you fall from heaven? What made this mighty angel fall from heaven? What made him fall? It says, for thou hast said in thy heart. Revelation 12 says he practices deception. So did he tell the angels his true agenda? No. no. But who knew? God. Now imagine this with me now. Imagine this with me. War has broken up. Two sides have loomed. Two sides. We read in Revelation 12. Michael and his angels. The devil and his angels. God kicks him out because two sides have voted. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Two sides have voted. We're at home. You don't live by my rules anymore. I've given you chance. 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 And particularly the nature of your problem is going to affect the whole household. Does that make sense? The only time I believe parents should cook out children is when the problem itself, the problem itself is going to affect the whole household. If it's going to affect the whole household, let me give you a simple example. Let's say that my temple was so bad. No, let me keep it more simple than that. Let's say I was bringing drugs into the home. My mum gives me charge, my mum gives me charge, my mum gives me charge. The nature of the problem, this is not just me not listening or, you know, I'm trying to watch my own TV programs. The nature of the problem is of such, if she does not take action, my brother is going to get taken away too. Does that make sense? So the nature of the problem was such, you've decided, right, you've decided, now I can kick you out. That's, the, that's as much as I can do. But he couldn't destroy Satan right then and there. If God went, zap, what would have the good angels have thought? Fearful. Because they would have said, why did you destroy him? And if God said, well, I knew his heart, I knew he actually wanted to take my throne and murder me. They're like, well, what proof is there of that, Lord? There was none. Because Isaiah says he said it in his heart. The Bible says he's a serpent. He deceived the angels to the true intent of his campaign. He's like an MP trying to set up a new government. I will set my throne. That's a new order. That's a new government. New laws. New requirements. I want this one to exist. Some angels said, you know what? He has a point. But they didn't fully understand the true implications of following Satan. 
So God couldn't destroy him at that time. He had to let the true intents of his heart play it out. And we are in that experiment right now, seeing the true results of what it means to follow the devil. What it means to follow the devil? What is the condition in the world today? Is not faith in the Bible as effectually destroyed by high criticism, speculation of today, as it was by tradition and rabbinism in the days of Christ? Have not greed and ambition and love of pleasure as strong a hold on men's hearts now as they had then? In the professedly Christian world, even in the professed churches of Christ, how few are governed by Christian principles. I don't know if you follow YouTube or follow news in the Christian world. Do you know how many scandals there are in the Christian churches? How many ministers being charged for pedophilia and rape in, in the most biggest churches in America? Driving Bentleys and Ferraris and Porsches when down the road people are starving from food. Even in the professed churches of Christ, how few are governed by Christian principles. Do you know how many people I've met who've been disillusioned with Christianity because of what they've seen in church? In the Sunday churches and even our own. Disillusioned. We met a guy witnessing on the street. You think I'm talking theory? I'm going to give you the testimony. My brother met a guy on the street witnessing and we found out that this young man used to be a Christian, faithful Christian. Faithful to God. Faithful, faithful. Now he doesn't believe in any of it. Why? He saw in his mind, he saw the spirit of God working. He saw miracles working. Then he found out that pastor was <coughs> practicing corruption behind closed doors. Sleeping around with the members. Pocketing the money. But yet he said, how on earth can the spirit of God be using him? But at the same time, he's living in known secret sin. Disillusioned disillusioned because the character of God has been blasphemed among them. In business, social, domestic, even religious circles, how, how few making the teachings of Christ the rule of daily living. It is, is it not true that justice, justice standeth afar off, equity cannot enter, and he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey? We are living in the midst of an epidemic of crime at which thoughtful, God-fearing men everywhere stand aghast. The corruption that prevails, it is beyond the power of the human pen to describe. Every day, fresh revelations of political strife, bribery and fraud, every day brings its heart-sickening record of violence and lawlessness of indifference to human suffering, of brutal, fiendish destruction of human life. Every day testifies to the increase of insanity, murder and suicide. Who can doubt that satanic agencies are at work among men? With increasing activity to distract and corrupt the mind and defile and destroy the body. Example, Fusilier Rigby. Age 25, run over and then butchered by Michael Adelabalajo and Michael Adebowali in May 2013 on a street in Woolwich, South East London, in front of numerous witnesses in broad daylight. They tried to sever his head in broad daylight. And if that don't wake you up, nothing will. So I will not apologize for raising my voice. I'm going to apologize for being excited and passionate. When I saw that, I feared for my household. But we are so benumbed to sin that we can see that on the TV and not run to Christ. People were standing by, looking at him and getting said seven in broad daylight. And we sit here and we just like, signs of the times. If that doesn't move you to witness, if that doesn't move you to save some souls in your family, you are dead. And the only thing that may wake you up when it's too late and the seven last plagues start falling on this planet. ISIS is going around putting videos on YouTube. I've never watched any of them because I don't want to watch them. 
beheading people and the news media is promoting that that's and i read an article today that where one news report said that's desensitizing people to how bad the situation is even the world can know that beheading people in broad daylight chopping up women putting them in suitcases in the back of their gardens because of religious convictions she was from one religious um, faction and she went to marry another man from another religious faction. The father chopped up in pieces. I'm reading this, I'm saying to myself, Lord, what are we as a people doing? I open the newspaper, the Express and Star, all I read is murder, crime. I'm like, I ain't paying for this nonsense no more. I want to read this. It's discouraging. It's depressing. And in the place where we should be getting hope, the place where we should be getting encouragement, the place where we should be getting motivated to deal with the inward evil in our hearts so we can deal with the outward evil in our hearts, we don't get no encouragement. To be battered and bruised from within when I have enough problems from without, that's what many people are saying to themselves, especially young people. You don't know the trials that I go through. Do you know adults? Let me pay the picture for you, adults. I know some of you are living in cuckoo land. Do you know your young people get posted? Young men, do you know, do you know your young people get images of naked... The, the, let, me, let me slow down. Can I get too excited? Do you know young boys get images of naked girls sent to their phones? Did you know that? Your sons. That's right. Your sons. Talk to them. We, that didn't happen in my school because we didn't have mobiles. Young girls offering what you know what, you know what I'm talking about, offering it to them in school. We are going lower and know what's the next generation going to be like. In the toilet the thing is done in school. How do I know this? Because I talk to the young people and they tell me what they see. So we need to hear something of power. The Bible says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth. The gospel is not about your power. The gospel is not about my power. The gospel is God's power. God's power to redeem sinners from the corruption that Satan has brought them through. You don't think we need power after I've just mentioned some of these things? Is the gospel only to the church? Is the gospel only to the good people? The gospel is even to fanatical ISIS members of, of Islam. That's power. Who was Paul? Who was Paul? Was he a good man? He thought he was. What did he do, church, before he became converted? Persecuted. What does that mean? He killed Christians. He was a murderer. You hold, your, you hold in your hand a book that most of the New Testament was written by a former murderer. Moses, the Bible declares, the meekest man on the earth. You hold in your hand a book where he wrote the first five books of the Bible, but he murdered a man with his bare hands and buried him in the sand. David wrote the largest book in the Bible. Adulterer planned it. And it conspired to get her husband murdered. He wrote the largest book of the Bible, Psalms. If those guys stepped into church today, we would, dis we would censor them. We wouldn't trust them with the treasury. We wouldn't trust them to do the gospel because of their past. Because we don't believe in the changing power of the gospel. The very book you hold is with men who were wicked before they met Christ. Men who were degraded before they repented of their sins because of the cross that they saw. That's why I love this book, because it's not made up of people who claim to be perfect. It's made up of people who are transformed by the love of God. It gives me hope. I don't stand here professing any goodness, but I stand here professing that I know God can change hearts. I'm going to close. I'm going to close with this um, statement. It's from Steps of Christ, page 18. Church. God loves us, amen? amen. 
And I'm so glad that when I was doing my foolishness, I'm so glad that when I was in the world, and I'm not going to tell you what I used to do. When I was in the world, and what I mean by in the world, that doesn't mean, you know, I didn't go to church anymore. That doesn't mean I didn't, you know, have some kind of faith in God. I did, I sincerely did. But my life wasn't a reflection of the God I said I served. And I didn't know what that really meant. I didn't know the seriousness of my sins. And even, and even when I came to that knowledge of that, I was, I was depraved, I was guilty, I was failing. I, I even stopped going to church for a little while because I didn't want to play the hypocrite. I still, in my heart, deep down, wanted hope. I wanted an answer. And it came when I heard about Jesus, the Jesus I preached today. It came when it was presented to me that, Mike, even though you're like this, even though you sinned against him, even though you knew what was right, but you chose what was wrong, the Bible says, I have died for your sins. But God commended his love towards us. Romans 5 verse 8. In that, why were we yet sinners? Christ died for us. Not why you were interested. Not why you were trying to better yourself. Not why you were trying to be good. No, why you was in the very mess itself. That's when God poured out all of his favor on you. So you don't need to earn his favor because we've already got his favor. So what's the point of following you then, Lord, if you already love me? He just wants you to respond. That's it. When you hear of how much he's done for you, respond. When you hear that Christ has paid for your sins, disrespecting your mom, not listening to your dad, not listening to the rules of the house, when your mom pays the bills, when your mom puts, you know, the food on the table and she asks for a simple requirement and you don't want to know about it. Why am I keep talking about that? Because I used to be a young man like that. And every time I read my Bible, God reminds me of how disrespectful I was to my mom. And yet he's saving grace on my rebellious heart. Change that rebellious heart to a willful heart. It is impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin. Did you hear that? It's impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin in which we are sunken. Our hearts are evil and we cannot change them. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. The carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Job 14, verse 4, Romans 8, 7. Education, culture, the exercise of the will, human effort, all have their proper sphere. But here they are powerless. Did you hear that? The human will doesn't make you a Christian. Education cannot make you a Christian. Cannot change your heart. Here in this fear to change one's heart, it's powerless. It's powerless. We can put on nice clothes and come to church on the right day and believe the right doctrines, but if the heart's not changed, you're going nowhere. Don't kid yourself. You're going nowhere. God hasn't sent his son to die on the cross for you and I to stay the same. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say they had a vase right here. Very nice vase. And in my excitement, you see me preaching. Boop, I knock over that vase. It drops on the floor. It breaks into a million pieces. I'm going to be sorry, right? I'm going to go to Brother Horatio and say, Bro, I take out my you know, we used to use checks back in the day. Take out my checkbook and I say, Brother Horatio, here's a check. 50 pounds should cover it. Brother Horatio, being a good brother, looks at me and, my, yes, that's not gonna cover it. Okay, I ripped that one up, 100 pounds. He looks at me again, kind of sheepishly and say, that's, that's still not gonna cover it. Okay, okay, 500. Here, that, that should, what kind of vase is that, man? That should death recover it. I look on his face and I'm like, all right, brother man, how much is this thing worth? He says to me, there's only 
three of those in the world, there is no price. The other two are in Madame Tussauds and the other one is in some other museum somewhere. This one is a rare kind. There's no real value. The value is maybe millions. What if it's going to happen to, happen to my sorrow right then and there? Do you think I'm going to feel a little bit more sorry? Do you think? I see people nodding, of course. Now what has changed? What changed that made my sorrow be that small, so to speak, and then my sorrow just increased a hundredfold? What changed? When I understood the price of the thing I broke. When we are so self-satisfied with our own self-righteousness, with our own goodness, I'm doing my Bible study, I'm eating the right food, I do my exercise. When we place confidence in our good deeds and not on the merits of Jesus, not on the fact that he died for my sins, not on the fact that he's perfect, not on the fact that he's good, we feel no need for reformation. Because we're satisfied. I mean the standard. What need am I to repent? What need am I to reform? I meet to the standard. I keep the Sabbath. I read my Bible. I don't eat meat. I listen to the right music. I don't watch this on TV. I don't lie. I don't steal. I don't even commit adultery. I don't bow down to idols. I'm doing quite fine, thank you very much. Who are you to tell me I need to repent? Look at the law and see if you're okay. Look at your motives. Look at your life. Do people unreservedly know you are Christian? Are you oozing the love of God? Here they are powerless. They may produce an outward correctness of behavior, but they cannot change the heart. They cannot purify the springs of life. There must be a power working from within. A new life from above before men can be changed from sin to holiness. That power is Christ. That power is Christ. His grace alone can quicken, that word quicken is an old word to mean give life. They can quicken the lifeless faculties of the soul and attract it to God to holiness. The only power that can change our heart from sin to holiness is Christ. And that power is the grace and love of God. That's the only thing that can do it. Not willpower, you need willpower, but all willpower does, it allies yourself to take hold of the rope that's going to save you. All this will does, it makes you move, but it cannot change. And as soon as you will to obey, God supplies the power to change. That's all willpower does. God loves us very much, church. He loves us very, very much. And he's not willing that any of us should perish but that all of us should come to repentance. And my appeal is very simple. My appeal is very simple. I've got two appeals. The first one is to those, and I'm speaking especially to young people because this was me. You've grown up in church. You do believe in God. You have a belief in God. You believe in the Bible, but you know you're not a real Christian. You know the things I've said, new to you today. You know your heart, the heart, it doesn't beat for Christ. Your word, your conversation doesn't talk of Christ. Your love, your love is a love for the world, but not for holy things. That's evidence you're not changed. I used to be there, I know what it looks like. Do you love Bible study and pray? If you say no, you're not changed. Because one who's changed loves to converse with Jesus, loves to converse about Jesus because now he's become a friend and he's not no longer a theory. He's not a man who he hears about. 
Now that man is someone that dwells in their heart, young people, young person, I'm speaking to you. If you want Christ to change your heart, as this passage says, as inspiration says, I'm giving you an opportunity today to receive that gift in Jesus' name. Come to the front. Don't wait no longer. Don't keep yourself. If you want that love, if you want a relationship with Jesus, you want Jesus to be real, better than reality, better than your present reality now. You know you're messed up. You know you don't have confidence in God. You know you're not real with him, but you've heard something today that inspires hope in you. I'm inspiring you. I'm inviting you. Come to the front. That's my first appeal. Second appeal for those of us who have given our lives to Christ. But we know in our hearts we've fallen back. We know in our lives we're not doing what we know we should be doing. I'm inspiring you as well to come to the front, to receive a revival from Christ today. You want to be genuinely revived. You want to live like Jesus. You want to be like Jesus in every single way. Yes, you've given your heart to God, but you know you've fallen back. Wherever that is, you know where that is. I'm inviting you to the front. Young person I'm speaking to, you want to be like Christ. You want to be a genuine Christian. You want to have power to save you. You want that. I'm inviting you to come to the front. That's my first appeal. My second appeal for those who want revival as well. As I pause to give you time to think, I pray that you pray in your hearts to make the right decision today. For you might not get it again.